is the acting puppet pasta. It's me, Stefano. Since David, if that is his real name, is away, I will fill in with the pastor's notes. If you are not getting emails, then tell somebody. If you want to know what we believe, to get baptized, to become a member, let someone know. Why? Because we want people to meet Jesus. Okay, announcements. Saturday, 16 March, men's breakfast, 8 o'clock. Go and eat some men. Tasty. That Saturday, also M and M and M. 4 p.m. meeting, 5 p.m. fellowship meal, 6 p.m. for mayhem. A night of games and fun. Come to one or all of these events. Everyone is welcome, even tigers. Easter is coming. Make sure you invite family and friends to our Palm Sunday service, March 24. It will be great. Alpha course is coming up. Watch the video. Watch it now. Now it is kids time. Are there any children here? Yes, maybe. Then sing. Sing like you have never sung before. Hello children, it's me, Stefano, best of tigers. The kids' time is very short today. Read with me. What did Jesus say? The time, the time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. God's kingdom is a wonderful place and there is room for everyone. Anyone who repents that means to turn away from bad things in their life and believes, which means to trust in Jesus, can be part of God's kingdom. And the kingdom of God is everywhere that Jesus is king. So now it is time for everyone, everyone, to stand up and shake hands with someone you have not greeted yet today. And the first person will say, Tigers are good. And the second person will say, No! Tigers are best! Or perhaps you can say, God's kingdom is nearby. And the other person can say, repent and believe. Okay, do it! Do it! Stand up and shake hands! Do it! And then kids, go out to Sunday school. Okay, goodbye, goodbye, goodbye! Thank you, Eva, and your team. That was fantastic. And I particularly love the tiger. I'm going to take the tiger home with me. Well, I thought we'd continue just having a little bit of fun this morning. Do you know the difference between a sheep and a goat? Are you sure? Okay, so I've got 
a, a couple of examples up here, and they're going to flash up, and I want you to tell, shout out for me if it's a sheep or a goat. Okay, ready? Okay, sheep or goat? Sheep. Yes, it's a merino sheep. Sheep or goat? Oh, you have just hands up if you think it's a sheep. Hands up if you think it's a goat. Well, it tells you now it's, a, it's an Awazi sheep. Okay, next one, sheep or goat? It's an Angora goat. <laughs> okay, sheep or goat? Goat, that one's easy, isn't it? It's a Tottenberg, uh, no, it's, yeah, it's not an Angora goat, it's a Tottenberg goat. Sheep or goat? Oh, now come on, you guys told me you knew what you were doing. It's a Valnais black nose sheep. Okay, and this is the one that tricks everybody. Ready? Sheep or goat? It's actually a sheep. It's an order sheep. Okay. Well, you know, sometimes these things can be really confusing. And, you know, in ancient Israel, when they used to have their flocks, they used to have their sheep and their goats all in together. And so the shepherds would have their sheep and the goats. And so Jesus tells this great story about separating the sheep and the goats. And I want to actually have a look at that one today because often we read it in the terms of um, what's going to happen on Judgment Day. And that's, and that's the context it was written in. But this story actually teaches us a lot of what it means to be a sheep. So remember Jesus puts a sheep on his right and he says, you know, come, you're all the good ones. So we're going to find out what it means to be a sheep. So we're going to read from Matthew 31, um, sorry, Matthew 25, verses 31 to 40. It said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you whenever you Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. Did you know that Judaism and Christianity are different from any other religion in the world, particularly in ancient times? In ancient times, I would do something nice for somebody for one of two reasons. I would do something nice for them because... I would, they would, um, they could in turn do something to care for me. So I could come to them and I might go, Pastor Don, please come and sit at the head of my table tonight. I want you to do great, you know, everybody to see you, everybody to know how fantastic you are. Knowing that tomorrow, I was going to go and I was going to hit Don up for a loan. And when I did that, I would be able to say, hey, well, you know, remember last night? I was really great to you and, and now you need to be really nice to me. 
Or the other reason is that they would want to be recognised as a philanthropist. Look what a wonderful person I am. I'm giving alms to the poor. They were the two reasons. It had everything to do about people's perception of the person or what they could get out of it. But that is not the motivation for Christians. For us, our motivation is this. And the kingdom of God will say to those on his right, come, you, are, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Now, I want you to think about this. It is not so that you will be saved. You are not doing good things for other people so that God's going to look at you and go, yep, look at that child. She's really good or he's really good. Pat on the back. Come into my kingdom. That's not the motivation that we have for serving others. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 says, It is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by work so that nobody can boast. We are, God is not saying, you do these things. You feed the poor. You, you give them something to drink. You give them some clothes, and I will let you come into the kingdom. But he is saying, the people that are called my people are going to do these things because they are my people. You know, this is the DNA of a sheep. The di- you know, just like we could see the difference between the sheep and the goats at the beginning, this is the DNA of the sheep. A sheep is going to be caring for all those that are around them. That is what a Christian really looks like. He is going, or she is going to feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty, etc., etc., etc. You know, John Wesley would also say that we love God, we love other people, sorry, because of our love of God. And I'm going to paraphrase one of his sermons, and I love the sermon title for this one. It's a doozy. He says, an earnest appeal to men of reason and religion. But I'm not going to read it to you in as he wrote it because he wrote it in the 17th century and it doesn't always translate really well into our modern English. But this is basically what he said. Shouldn't you love God? Because God gave you life and breath and all things and he continues to love you day by day. And does not that love expect a love in return? Therefore, is it not right that we should love our neighbours? God loves us and he's expecting us and our love for God is, actually has a horizontal element when loving, loving our neighbours. Therefore, is it not right that we should love our neighbours? In fact, our lives should be one continual labour of love. Who should feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit those who are sick or in prison? Should we stop being compassionate towards others just because they're miserable because of their own actions? If we had medicine, shouldn't we freely give it as we freely receive from God? This is the sum of our preaching. This is the scary bit, this this next sentence. Our enemies are our judges for how we have shown God's love. Our enemies are our judges for how we Christians have shown God's love to others. In other words, he's saying God loves us so much. He has done so much for us that we need to reach out with this love to those that are around us. Our lives need to be this continual labour of love. 
a lifelong labour of love. Now, I have a question for you, and you have to respond to this. Is anybody in this congregation here right now dead? No? None of you? That means that you all still have... I can see somebody just, just checking there. You all have a job still to do. This is your job. And it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. You have a job to do. And, you know, one of the things that really hits me about this list is that they're not hard. You don't need to be a pastor to be able to do them. You don't need to have a theological degree. You don't even need to have a high school diploma to be able to follow through these things. There are five things that this passage says that we should be able to do, and we can do, young or old. Give somebody a drink. Feed them if they're hungry. Give them clothes if they need some. And visit the sick or in prison and invite these strangers in. So I want to have a look at those five things because these are responsibilities that we as individual Christians can each do every day of our lives. Put your hand up if you are capable of giving somebody who is hungry something to eat. Now, come on, the rest of you, I'm sure you can too. You can make a sandwich, okay, or toast, or a cup of tea. You know, I can have somebody come into my house and I'll make them a sandwich. But I've also had people, met homeless people on the street who have asked me for food or money. Normally they ask for money. Normally I go, I don't give money, but I'd be happy to take you in there and buy you some food. So am I doing what Jesus had said by doing that? What about giving somebody something to drink? I remember years ago having a door-to-door salesperson come to our house. And it was one of those stinking, stinking hot days. And they arrived beet red trying to sell me. I can't even remember what. And I said to them, look, I'm not interested in what you have to sell. But would you like some cold water? And they went, that would be so nice. And so they came in and they sat down in my house for 10 minutes and they had a couple of glasses of cold water and then they went on their way again. I've got to tell you, I don't normally invite total strangers into my house, but as he's standing there, this verse pops into my head. And I went, I need to invite you in. I need to invite you in and give you something to drink. Can you clothe the naked? Can you help somebody who has no clothes find some clothes? Now, I've got to tell you about the way that John Wesley did this because it just really hits me. During John Wesley's time, Britain and France were at war. Nothing unusual in in that era for Britain and France to be at war. They were at war a lot. In the area that John Wesley was visiting was a jail that was housing just over a 1,000 French prisoners. And he went in to visit them. He got permission to go and visit them and found that they were all just sitting on some grimy little bits of straw and dressed in absolute rags. So he went out that day and he preached on Exodus 23, verse 9, which says... Thou shalt not oppress the stranger, for you know the heart of the stranger, seeing you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So after he preached, they collected some money and he bought some material, got it all made up into clothes for them and clothed all these French prisoners. Twelve months later, he goes back to that same area, goes to visit the prison and finds the prisoners in exactly the same state that 
that they had been 12 months ago. Now, think about this. They have one set of clothes and you're wearing them for 365 days. And clothes in that time, you know, they weren't very robust. And so they all fell apart. So he went out and he preached and collected money and did it all over again. What about visiting those that are sick or in prison or being a stranger and inviting them in? You know, a person moves into your street. Do you go and welcome them and invite them over for a cup of tea? Take a cake? That's, that used to be what we did. But it seems to have gone by the wayside these days. Or a new person comes to church and you say, hey, would you like to come for lunch afterwards? You know, Yates famously said, there are no strangers here, just friends that we haven't met yet. And I think that that would be Jesus' thoughts. Each one of us needs to be doing each one of these things in our everyday life. This is how we show Christ's love to others. We, we need to speak it as well, but this is how we are showing Christ's love to others. But sometimes people need more help than just what an individual can give them. I can give a certain number of people, homeless people, a lunch, but I can't help big enough than that. This is where um, agencies like Wesleyan Community Care are coming in. So for those of you that have not heard about Wesleyan Community Care yet, you've probably heard about World Hope. So World Hope Australia um, existed and it was doing work in Cambodia and Sierra, Sierra Leone and other places. Wesleyan Community... It, World Hope Australia has morphed into Wesleyan Community Care. And what we are looking at is how to help people in Australia that are doing it tough. And we do this by partnering with churches and helping them to come alongside. Because at the moment there is one of me and there is... I can't be everywhere. But we have 100, almost 100, 99, I think, churches across Australia. And so we're going, how can we, as an organisation, help you feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give them something to drink? And there's lots of different avenues that are happening across the land. We work predominantly in these areas. Oh, actually, that's our mission up there, and I can't even read it. Sorry. Um, we work in these areas. We work in family strengthening, migrant support, um, Indigenous support, and I've got them around the wrong way here, health and well-being and disaster relief and, and youth empowerment. And so we're saying, if you think about your outreach that you do as a church and that other churches are doing, this is the way that we, we can come together and we can support it. We've been helping churches set up food banks and op shops. We've helped a church, um, we're helping a church in Walker Mary in Arnhem Land set up a community garden because at the moment they've got severe food scarcity. They're eating one meal a day. And so we're going, this is not good enough. These guys are hungry. So let's help them work out how they can grow their own food and, and get some going. We want to help support you in your role as Jesus' sheep. You should have received a little card on the way in. On the, that card is a code that you can, you know, if you show with your show with your phone and and it'll hook you straight into Donor Bank. If you choose, you can make a donation like that. We have different, um, if you go to our website, which is also on that card, you can see the different projects that, that we have going at the moment. We have 
the one, the one out at Walker, Bear and Mary, we have one for disaster relief. I am going to be um, initiating a new program in the next coming weeks for our refugees and migrants. They are areas that you can support. But I would also encourage you just to support the general Wesleyan community care. Because, you know, I know that this is not exciting or anything else, but at the end of every month or every couple of months, the insurance people put their hand out and go, Kathy, we need you to pay insurance. And the, the various other um, tools that we need to be able to work for you and for our churches and for the people in our wider communities also need support. So I am saying, hey, can you help us as support us as a as a church? The other way is, you know, if and when you as a church go, we want to do something or we need some support with one of our programs that is already existing, um, I can come in and I'm actually available to help you set up programs that you're running or help you assess or help you get grants for them. We're putting some policy, we're doing some policy writing together that can go across the entire district. We're doing training of our pastors and key leaders in these areas. And so these are the types of things our job is to help you do your job in this area. I want to leave you with two thoughts this afternoon, this morning. First of all, it is not enough to feed the hungry, visit the sick and those in prison and never say anything about Jesus. I can do all of those great things, but if I never say anything about Jesus, they're not going to come to know how much God loves them. They're not going to come into that saving knowledge of grace. The danger can be that I can do all those things and they will look and go, oh, what a lovely person that Mary is. She, she always helps me. But they're not realising that she's helping because of the love of God for that person as, a, as, as an individual. But the second danger is this. Sometimes I hear Christians say, if I can't evangelise at the same time, I shouldn't do anything. I might, ha I might say, this first one, that's why we work with churches. Because I know that as you're helping them, as you're meeting with them, you are going to talk to them maybe about Jesus. But I want to look at this, this point of not being able to evangelise at the same time because sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can't actually um, say something right there on the moment. You might have to form relationships with them and there is a time that you can say something and that you can tell them. But it may not be, you know, I, I, I'm not into let's, do, let's give out some free food and you have to listen to a sermon before I give out the free food. That, that's not what we're into. But John Wesley was asked that question. He was asked this question. He says, what good is it to give people food and clothes if their souls are going to hell? And his answer was this, whether they be lost or saved, you are expressly commanded to feed the hungry and clothe the naked, etc., etc. Although it is God only changes hearts, yet he generally does it through men. Jesus expressly commands us to care for the widows and the orphans, to feed the hungry and to clothe the naked. And throughout the last 2,000 years, there's been lots of examples of Christians doing this. Deacons have been appointed and given the responsibility to see to the physical needs of those in their midst. And, you know, the early Methodist church was really known for this. This was part of the DNA of the Methodist church. And it's part of the DNA of being a Christian. 
They intentionally looked for the ways that people were suffering in their communities and then looked to how they could alleviate that pain. And that's a great way of doing it because it's no good me saying, we're going to set up this program and it's going to work in every single church in Wesley Methodist Church in Australia because your church here in Logan is different from the Hills Church over at Everton Hills is different from the Townsville Church, is different from Walker and Mary, is different from the ones down south. So we need to be working in the communities that we are in. The area of service is going to change according to what we see them around. While there are many examples of them caring for the sick and feeding the poor in their midst, they set up schools they, to educate the kids of the poor. They were involved in the prison systems. In, in America, they were very involved in helping the escaped slaves get to safety. When you look around Logan, what can you do in the name of Jesus, individually and together as a church, to fulfil Matthew 25? And this is my prayer, that people will be able to see you and know without question that you are a sheep because you have all of the characteristics of living the life as Christ's sheep. Let me pray for you. Lord, Eva kept telling us about the love of God before. And it is so true and so good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for your love. And I know that you don't just love those that are here in our midst and those that are within the Christian church, but you love every individual that you made. And you have called us to care for them. Lord, I pray that you can show us your ways, that we are to do this both individually and together as, the, as a, this ch- church in Logan and throughout Wesleyan Community Care. Lord, we long to see people suffer less and we long to see people come to faith In Jesus Christ, may we step out and do this day by day. Amen. Thank you, Eva.